Welcome to Clock and Bell, may I take your order? Hi, 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 Jakey Steve here, the long-haired freaky dude. Today I'm going to review Stephen Hawking's The Universe in a nutshell. This is pretty much a fun introduction into the world of theoretical physics and quantum physics. You're probably asking, why on earth do I have a turkey on my head? Or if your mind's in the gutter, you're probably asking something a little different. But the answer to both of those questions is the same. Quantum physics. It gives me the excuse to do anything I want. It's real crazy and fun like that. I've been embarking on a remarkable journey into the magical land known as physics. I've been getting my first taste of it from a few classes at school, and I absolutely love it. It's just so... Fascinating, and it's incredibly fun seeing and predicting how things work. Particularly, no pun intended, our brief discussions on quantum physics. The mysterious stuff out there just blows my mind. What we don't know, what we could know, the unknown. It is indeed alluring. But the course that I'm taking, the one at school, it stays mostly on the track of Newtonian physics. So I wanted to sort of branch off from that and, and jump in to test the waters of quantum physics, get at least a foundation of it. So in order to fan out to the quantum realm, I read this book at the recommendation of my father, who is a carpenter. He said it'd be a great introduction, and indeed it has been. Now, this isn't like a, a textbook or anything. It's meant to be an introduction in layman's terms, and it's intended purely to spark interest and to give uh, uh, some sort of meaning to these incredibly complex topics. It's meant to be an introduction in layman's terms, and it's intended purely to spark interest and to give the common man like you and I a basic understanding of these incredibly complex topics. For example, what is the string theory? You hear it all the time, but what does it mean? After reading this, something actually intelligent pops into my head. Not a cat playing with a ball of yarn. Or, you know, something along those lines. I've actually got a sliver of understanding connected with that term now. And that goes for all the stereotypical things associated with this bizarre field. Supergravity, 11 dimensions, pea brains, quantum mechanics, the uncertainty principle. Things you, you probably hear all the time, but practically have no knowledge of. This book will definitely change that. It is a great starting point. Not just for knowledge, but for sparking interest. It puts substance to the names. Now, Stephen Hawking, he's actually a fantastic writer. He explains complex concepts in simple terms with fun and whimsical comparisons. And Hawking, he's actually a, a funny writer. I suppose being the horrible person I am, I assumed he'd be like some strict, dry, grumpy guy. So my expectations were blown away. He's also incredibly excited about his appearance in Star Trek. Now, if you're interested in the details of this content, Stephen Hawking takes a positivist approach. In other words, he, he credits what we sense and what we observe and how that shapes our interpretations and understanding of the world, the universe, as it applies to physics. Use what works mathematically. So there are some things in here which Hawking is reluctant to agree upon, or reluctant to believe in, but does nevertheless because it works out mathematically. Uh, for example, he is he's skeptical that there is more than four or five dimensions, but mathematically there should be about ten or eleven. So even though he has a hard time believing in more than five dimensions, he still credits them. So what all does Hawking cover in this book, The Universe in a Nutshell? First, he gives a little history, a little backstory of quantum, uh, particle, and theoretical physics, and, and especially how they relate to how they were started by Albert Einstein's theories of relativity, which were really the first accepted pieces of physics to not abide by these strict Newtonian guidelines. He then gives us basic concepts of things that branches off from this theory, and uh, how they relate especially to space-time. This involves things like the, the uncertainty principle, which was discovered by Heisenberg. Yes, the guy that uh, Walter White named himself after in Breaking Bad. So in other words, we can't know both something's velocity and something's position at the same time, which unfortunately creates a bit of a conundrum for uh, predicting the future, alas. For in order to predict the future, one needs to know both velocity and uh, position, or at least as theorized by Laplace. Now, Hawking's musings of space and time are rather interesting. He proposes that our universe's time is not boundless. Rather, it is bound within a finite amount of time. It had a beginning, and I suppose this implies that it will have an end 
as well. Now Hawking gave some fairly detailed explanations for this, which I had to read a few times in order to, to fully understand what he was getting at. And uh, I looked up some videos online too. I, I checked Khan Academy, but unfortunately they don't really have much stuff on quantum physics. So I had to go beyond that to YouTube. And I did find some things which were helpful, which if I remember, I will put those links down below. But uh, essentially his uh, proof or evidence for this is that we can see back to the beginning of time, the very beginning of time. This point, the Big Bang, the singularity. But his explanation for how we see it is incredibly fascinating, but it's also a little dense. How time is pear-shaped. Now, I understand how it comes out to a cone. He, you know, he says time comes out to in a cone shape, but then due to X-ray radiation and such, it curves back into a pear shape, and then there's like that little point at the very tip of the pear, which is the beginning of time, sort of like the North Pole on Earth. It's not, you know, really a pointy point, but it is nonetheless the top of the Earth. You can't go any further no north. That's essentially what he's saying with time on this pear shape. Mind-blowing stuff. And even more interesting, in order for the math to work out, you know, as we said, he's a positivist, there needs to be a dimension at right angles to time. And this isn't spatial dimension, this is another dimension, which he likes to call, uh, a fifth dimension, imaginary time. So if you thought time wasn't just a crazy enough concept as it is, there is also imaginary time. Yeah, that's right. The imaginary time is passing by. And he also talks a lot about black holes. That is what he's notorious for, after all. And for our fortunate minds, he blesses us with a few quantum mechanical equations concerning the matter. Oh boy, no pun intended there either. It was exciting to find out that I actually understood what the heck these equations meant, what they were getting at and how they worked, thanks to the physics courses which I'm taking. Uh, for example, Schwarzschild's radius of a black hole, or Hawking's entropy of a black hole. Exciting stuff, really, and by providing us with these equations, it gives us the magical opportunity to perform some of these equations on our own. For example, want to see how big of a black hole would appear if Earth just suddenly collapsed in on itself? Turns out if Earth turned into a black hole, it would actually be only a few millimeters smaller than that gap right there between my fingers, which is kind of demasculating, man. But whatever. You know, I wonder what would happen if one encountered a black hole that small, like, you know, just floated on by, would you just get sucked in and pancaked around this tiny little thing? Like, if it, like, bumped into you, would it go through you and, like, leave a hole? Or would you just, like, all of you get sucked in? Or would it just, like, you know, rip a tiny part of you off? I don't know. It'd be fun to play with a tiny little black hole, I think. Oh, look at it, it's just so cute. But his musings of black holes are fascinating and his theories behind them are incredible. It is why he is one of the most well-known scientists of the 20th century. For example, one of the golden rules of quantum physics is that information can neither be created nor destroyed. You know, in the Newtonian realm, you have the, uh, the statement that matter can neither be created nor destroyed, which really doesn't apply to the quantum realm. So we have our own rule there, which is information can neither be created nor destroyed. So hopefully, at least in the mind of the physicist, they hope so, that this is true with black holes, but there might be some evidence to suggest that it's not. But if it is, which physicists hope, uh, there is this theory about it. So when something gets gobbled up by a black hole, its information remains, sort of frozen in time on the event horizon of the black hole. It stands to reason that something preserved in time on the event horizon of the black hole could then be reconstructed, or spit back out, which is simply mind-boggling. It could play it back like a record, as Hawking's put it. Now, I'm not sure the extremity of this, but, uh, you know, I like to think that if an astronaut got sucked into a black hole billions of years later when the black hole evaporates, he could spit back out. Now, I know it's, it's probably not like that, but it's fun to think about. I mean, it's quantum physics, man. Anything could happen. I mean, it does work like a hologram. It is abiding by the principles of holography. And the brief description of holography is fascinating in its own right. How the complete data for an object is imprinted on something 
in a very tiny space a few dimensions below it. So like us, a three-dimensional object can be imprinted on a 2D holography plate, a very small part of a 2D holography plate, you know, our entire 3D makeup. It's incredible. It is incredible. Also how black holes interact with pea brains, which are essentially membranes in the string theory. And how black holes interact with pea brains, which are essentially uh, membranes of a, uh, of a dimension in the string theory. You can think of a brain like this. Our universe as we see it all, is all bound within this four or five dimensional sheet. All the other dimensions of the 11 dimensional sheer theory are like really tiny and folded up in on themselves. Things that we can't really interact with. So we don't worry about those too much. Everything that we see and experience is in this brain. That's B-R-A-N-E, not B-R-A-I-N. Like membrane. Insane in the membrane. <clears throat> but there could be another brain in our quantum universe, let's call it, uh, with those, you know, uh, four or five dimensions also. But it isn't physically connected to our brain. It's like the pages of a book, there's layers. No, we can't see those other brains. We can't see those other brains even though they have the same dimensions, much like one page doesn't have the same words as another. But you can, however, experience the gravitational effects of a nearby brain. Gravity extends those brains because it is powerful and can extend across brains and dimensions. It's sort of like whenever you press really hard onto a piece of paper and you leave an impression on the, the, the pieces of paper below it. Those few pages below it have an identical but slightly weaker impression of the object, of, of what you wrote. You can't see the ink or the, the pencil marking which made the impression, but the impression is nonetheless there. The same applies to nearby brains and gravity. So we can experience gravity theoretically from things which we can never see, touch, or experience, or sensualize. Nothing in this universe, in this brain dimension, but something in a different brain universe dimension. Now Hawking's proposed that black holes have a gravity that is so strong that they can extend right into the other brains around them. And if there was also a black hole in that brain, then they would connect and it'd be sort of like a hole between the two. And from what I gather, there would essentially be this physical link between brains. Uh, this interaction of gravity in the brains could account for all of the dark matter in our universe. Dark matter, dark energy, this is stuff, it's stuff that we calculate, that we calculate should be there, but we don't see there. Another incredibly fascinating thing is vacuum pressure, negative energy, and virtual particles. Essentially there are in the vacuum of space where there should be nothing at all, no matter, no particles, these things, these pairs of particles called, volt, called uh, virtual particles, which just randomly zap into appearance, split apart from one another, and then come back together and annihilate each other. Now you might be wondering, what is the purpose of a virtual particle if its only meaning in life is to zap into appearance and immediately commit suicide? It's, it's like that switch whose only purpose is to turn itself off once you turn it on but it actually has very real effects in our universe. Each of those pairs of particles have a wave function, which could be a wave of an infinite number of waves. Now, whenever you have two objects in the vacuum of space with, you know, distance between them, it limits that number of infinite uh, waves that are possible. There's still an infinite number of waves, but there's a less number of infinite waves than in the outside vacuum. So it limits a larger number of infinite waves to a smaller number of infinite waves. And this creates a pressure, a negative energy, which makes absolutely no sense in Newtonian physics. Negative energy, what? You can't have a negative energy, but in the quantum realm with virtual particles creating virtual pressure, yes, you can have negative energy. And this pressure, in the vacuum of space where there should be nothing at all, moves the objects. In the Kashmir effect, it pushes objects together. I encourage you to look up a more in-depth video on the Kashmir effect. It is incredible. No, I'm not talking about the song by Led Zeppelin, though it is a good song. In the, the, the universe, this, this pressure is actually contributed uh, is, a, is an idea of why we are expanding, why we are getting further apart at a faster speed. 
You see, we're speeding up in our expansion. We are not slowing down as would make sense, but it could be explained by vacuum pressure. A few other things which Hawking talks about is wormholes in time travel, which is also incredibly fascinating. And then he talks about the evolution of the human mind and computers. With that said, this book was written in 2001. Hawking's made a few predictions, which are kind of cool considering they have since become right. Get this. Within a decade, many of us may even choose to live a virtual existence on the net, forming cyber friendships and relationships. It's happened. He also uses the Intel model for a computer growth rate, which says that it doubles, uh, you know, exponentially every 18 months, which it has. It's held true to that model. At the time that this was written, Hawking's pointed out that they didn't even have computers that were as intelligent as a mere inferior earthworm. Now, however, we have computer systems which are near the intelligence of a rodent, which is quite a huge step up from an earthworm. I mean, we're on almost mammalian level, which is quite remarkable, don't you think? I mean, to think that in our lifetime, we will see a computer that reaches the intelligence level of a human, which is kind of frightening, but it is inevitable, so I mean, we might as well just deal with it. And Hawking makes a good point on this, and uh, genetic engineering as well. He admits that it's nothing that any of us want to talk about. The, the, the thought frightens many of us. It's kind of a sucky thing in relation to humans, you know, we're modifying ourselves. It's just kind of strange, but unless we become a totalitarian society, as he puts it, it is bound, it is inevitable to happen. It will happen. Genetic engineering, computers, at our intelligence, it's going to happen. There is no way to stop it. So we might as well come to live with these terms. We might as well embrace it and learn to live with it. Now, another interesting thing, which just happened in a very, very, very recent history, like I'm talking, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, Hawking talks about this then theoretical thing, gravity waves. He, he pr proposed that gravity was a wave. Uh, just now, for the very first time, a group of researchers have actually experienced, have actually detected those gravity waves, proving that they do indeed exist. Uh, this has a lot of implications. This will te this will definitely increase our understanding of the universe, quantum mechanics especially, and it could be one step closer to creating some some really incredible things in the near future you know we're talking like uh you know some back to the future hoverboards maybe some time warps some warp bubbles in the space-time continuum who knows uh this gravity wave discovery it is definitely going to uh push the boundaries of technology and innovation so we're just one step closer you know perhaps the next thing we'll discover is the graviton which would also be interesting so my questions to you are I, how do you feel about the uh, genetic engineering of humans and uh, the growth rate of computers the, in, the increasing intelligence level of computers I know it's a very broad controversial topic but I don't know just state your general opinions down below and uh, oh I, I don't know uh, What's your opinion of quantum physics and how it has shaped the mindset of the 20th century? I mean, it has definitely changed how we look at things, how we think of things. Before that, we thought that everything was a certainty, that everything could be proved to exactness with science and math. But quantum, quantum theory just completely destroyed that. It showed that we can't know everything, especially, you know, with the uncertainty principle and with how chaotic the quantum world is. And that just shifted our view philosophically uh, in terms of the art that we made, uh, in terms of actions that we did historically. So, you know, feel free to talk about those, point those out, and uh, just generally how it has shaped human history overall. Well, I'm Jakey Steve, the long-haired freaky dude. Thank you for watching this book review. If you want to see more great book reviews, I encourage you to check out my channel. I've also got other things other than book reviews. Uh, there will be more great videos in the future, so I encourage you to hit the subscribe button down below. Actually, I implore you. Yes, I implore you. Uh, well, I hope you enjoyed the video. I'm Jake Steve. Be sure to have a great day.